Well, here we are in the office of the Australian delegation at the UNFCCC negotiations in Copenhagen. It's the middle weekend on the Saturday and the Australian delegation is still hard at work. In the room just over there, the minister's meeting with some people. On the table just down the way, the Prime Minister's special envoy on climate change is attending to work. This morning, our ambassador on climate change, Louise Hand, has been kind enough to give her a few moments of the day for an interview on some of your questions that you've posted on my blogs. So, I'll get underway. Louise. As you're probably aware, over 90,000 people turned out in Australia on Saturday to participate in the walk against warming. How do you feel leading the Australian delegation on climate change, which is an issue that so many Australians feel so passionately about? Well, well of course, it, it's a privilege to be part of this delegation. We've got um, interest, very, very strong interest from the Australian Prime Minister, and we've got um, Minister Wong here, and we have the Prime Minister's Special Envoy, and myself, and a, a delegation of very sort of committed and hard working people who have been working on this subject area for a long time. And so it's a great privilege to be here. On the march. One, one other oh, yeah. thing, Phil, I should tell you, your people might be interested. There's 37,000 people here at this conference, and the Danish government tell us that that's the largest intergovernmental meeting in history. It is very significant. Yeah, it's fantastic. It doesn't surprise me the number of people in the halls. Um, on the march, many people held banners calling for Australia to support Tuvalu and to support AOSIS, the Alliance of Small Island States. What are you doing as the representative for the Australian Government to support our Pacific Islands and their struggle for survival? Well, the Australian Government um, ha has, has done a lot of work over a long time with the Pacific Island countries, uh, including on climate change and on um, giving, uh, being on, totally on the front foot with adaptation funding for climate change. In the case of AOSIS, they're a very interesting group here in the negotiation. They are, they've got quite a strong coherence despite their differences. They've got some very intelligent and able negotiators. And they've just uh, done something quite interesting and pulled together uh, a text of their own which uh, reflects their national interest but in quite a sophisticated way goes a little bit further. And uh, for now, I think we're interested because the AOSIS text pr proposes some. Um, In regards to the legal form of the agreement, will Australia push to secure a second commitment period under the Kyoto Protocol so that we can focus next week on getting an additional and effective treaty for long-term cooperative action? Uh, Phil, it's a, a package negotiation. No one's going to give anything away until it's all looking right. And you'll have heard that many, uh, many of the delegations have said that they're perfectly prepared to consider um, commitment periods in the light of what comes out of the LCA negotiation. And one of the very important thrusts of the LCA negotiation is how we attract um, some internationalisation of commitments from non-Kyoto parties, which are big emitters. And once that's in the picture, then there'll be that, that will be um, the occasion to start looking at how the second commitment periods play out. But the Kyoto Protocol was designed that those annex one countries were laid down at a time when the world was quite different. And if we want to get to 450 parts per million or less, as our AOSIS colleagues would like, then it is absolutely essential that we get in those major emitters, which form about 90% about of likely emission rates by the time. So it's part of a deal. So do you think we're on track to achieve the deal that Australia wants? We're, we're right in the thick of it now, and I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't want to make a call, but we're right in the thick of it. There have been some interesting developments. Um, the, tech, the chairs have brought down these two texts, uh, which has, has sort of shifted the nature of the discussion. It's much more operational now, and we're moving into a phase where the Danish presidency will take over some of the drafting and the direction, and the Danes have been absolutely adamant from the beginning that they want an ambitious outcome. So we're going to be in Danish hands quite soon. So it's watch this space. Okay, I'm sure we will. Um, many people have been posting questions on my blogs about targets, the yep. goals for the stabilisation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. 
As the government acknowledges, a concentration of 450 parts per million would give only... Or less. Or less. Would give roughly a 50% chance of avoiding warming that is greater than 2 degrees, which is also a stated position of the Australian government. This scenario, however, is only possible if Australia moves to its more ambitious 25% target of the world. Will the government commit to greenhouse gas reductions, which would be consistent with a global agreement that will keep us well below 450 parts per million? Uh, the Australian government's target policy came out on the 4th of May and was announced by the Prime Minister, and you'll know that it's described in a range of a 5 to 15% cut. That's a range, and then a point of 25%. And under each one of those are a set of conditions. And that's the, that's the framework in which the government will assess the final target. Um, uh, given that, we've been working very hard as a delegation and as a government to try and help us optimise that scenario by creating the conditions where, where the targets, the various conditionalities will be met. But it remains to be seen where we come out.